Welcome to the Faithful Learning Podcast, where Christian faith meets classical learning. I am David Seibel. And I'm Jason Barney. And my last name rhymes with Bible. We are really excited to be here on this podcast with everyone. I think you're going to be really inspired and equipped to think about classical Christian education, about parenting, about things that matter for the next generation with myself and Jason Barney. So we are both involved in the classical education movement. We both have the opportunity to serve at a school in Carmel, Indiana called Corum Deo Academy. What does Corum Deo mean, Mr. Barney? That's a great question, Dave. Corum Deo is a Latin phrase. We tend to like Latin phrases in our classical education world, but Corum Deo is really important because it it says before the face of God. And the idea is that we want to live all of life before God's face and for his glory. And we think that has a lot to do with education. So education should be done before the face of God. And we think that changes everything. That's part of our I, core idea in this classical Christian education movement that uh, you can do math, science, literature, or art before God's face, that uh, he has something to say about all of those areas. And it's not just that we have chapel once a week or we do Bible, but that all truth actually makes sense and coheres in light of Christ. And so we think Christian parents should want that sort of education for their kids. Our kids are in the same grade. That is true. Our daughters stood next to each other at the Christmas concert. And uh, and worshipped, uh, as as I'm told. So that was a wonderful moment. If we had the, the prowess, we should provide a clip of the, the enthusiasm of our daughters at the Christmas concert. That would be powerful for, for people to see. Well, what we want to get into in this first episode is talking about the what, the why, the how of classical Christian education. Jason and myself are both involved with family interviews, doing tours, but for anybody, anybody washing dishes, mowing grass, wherever they're at, they want to know more about this movement that has grown a ton since COVID. That's why we're here on this podcast, trying to provide you insights in the front line. So I'd love to start with this, Jason Barney. And I know you you write and do a podcast, Educational Renaissance as well, here on the Faithful Learning Podcast. This audience is more to, to parents, to people who are concerned about the next generation that podcast is more to practitioners mm-hmm. within the movement. But tell us, how did you get involved in this movement? It's such an uh, amazing movement, I think. And of course, to anyone who's new, there's so many different definitions of classical. So I feel like just us sharing our stories might be helpful to diving in on what classical even means. What is this classical Christian education movement? But I feel like I could tell my story multiple different ways. So it's hard to start. Um, and we, we came in through different, uh, very different, we, uh, you routes. came in the front door. I snuck in, I climbed <laughs> over the back fence and broke in through a window into the, the castle of classical Christian education. So. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll start just by sharing when I was in college, I thought I would be a pastor. So I was planning to go get the MDiv. I thought to myself that maybe it would be good to get some real life work experience before just going on to more education. And so I remember distinctly talking to my advisor at Wheaton College about what I could do for a job after I graduated from my undergrad. This is Leland Riken, right? This is Dr. Leland Riken. He's the editor of my Bible I read this morning. Yes, he is. He was a great professor and um, I think embodies you are, many you are of the a privileged things. man. I am, Mr. I'm privileged to have learned from him, uh, as many have over the years. And uh, he directed me to this small little classical Christian school that was meeting in a rented church space across the street. And uh, he knew that I had taken Latin, so I'll kind of back up later to tell that story. But um, I was his resident Latinist uh, 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 at college, and I remember going over and sitting in this fourth and fifth grade Bible class where they were all in a circle, and all the kids had their Bibles. And I remember being floored initially by just seeing these kids reading the book of Jeremiah. But how many fourth and fifth grade classes read the book of Jeremiah, right? How many adults and read the book? I know, of Jeremiah? right? And and so they were there. The teacher ha- read out, I think this like probably a whole chapter, a long kind of prophetic oracle with all this stunning language. And then I remember her closing her Bible, having the students do the same. 
and calling on one student at random to begin telling back everything that he could remember from that. And I remember sitting there hearing this fifth grade boy tell back detail after detail after detail, using even some of the language from the book of Jeremiah too. And I remember just being floored and thinking to myself, I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm studying ancient languages, English literature. I do not think that I could have done what that fifth grade boy did right there. And it was because he had learned to attend, right? To listen closely. This is a skill that's so lost in our modern attention deficit age where we're just popping from one thing to another. Um, But that was amazing to me. That really showed me that kids could do something more than I thought they could. Um, if you lift the bar and then give them the the strategies to get there, the training, they can do amazing things. And then they they went in this particular class into a great discussion of the text. It was clear that they understood it. And I remember thinking, you know, I could go into ministry, do some sort of youth ministry, but all the hours that these kids spend in school, yeah, is it sixteen thousand hours in school, K through twelve? Yeah, if we could do this type of thing that I just saw with them, what an impact that would have for their faith, for their learning, right? We don't want to just offer them, you know, um, Jesus sprinkles in their educational experience. We mm. want them to go deep intellectually, as well as be spiritually grounded. And that was the kind of the 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 moment that brought me into classical Christian education. That's great. Well, maybe I'll share my intro story and then you can, then I'll ask you how you went deeper. Is that all right? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So behind, if you're watching the the video, you see the Wabash uh, banner. Uh, I went to Wabash College, which is an all-male liberal arts college. I went there as someone who played sports was, maybe would have said I was a Christian, was not really, uh, my, my creeds and my deeds did not match up though. And so going to an all-male liberal arts college. I went there because they had baseball. I remember when I was a senior, I tried to get out at the last moment and I was locked in. There was nothing I could do. So most of the people from my high school went to the typical state schools. But because of baseball, I wanted to uh, be in an environment where I could could play. And being in an all-male environment was one adjustment. But then being at a liberal arts school, I didn't even know what liberal arts meant. I imagine most people that are listening today have have no categories. What are the liberal arts, by the way, Jason Barney? Well, it depends, I suppose, on your list, but the seven canonical liberal arts are grammar, dialectic rhetoric, and then arithmetic, uh, geometry, music, and astronomy. So, yeah, I remember we were, we were taught to think critically, act responsibly, live humanely, and lead responsibly. So I basically... They never talked about the seven technical specific arts, but I think the heart was the same, that it's not just what to think, but how to think. So most of the people from my alma mater have that reputation that they can think for themselves and that they can lead. So I was exposed to that environment in college. I also came to Christ in that environment. My my junior year of college is when I began walking with the Lord, and immediately I wanted to do something I'd previously was a Spanish and economics double major, and I thought I wanted to travel and make money. And I realized that none of those things would satisfy my soul. And so immediately the first impact of coming to Christ was wanting to read a lot. I had previously only read books that I had to. I would have done spark notes in high school. So I'm definitely not the model student growing up, but that's why I got passionate about learning and education Part of why we named this the Faithful Learning Podcast is we think that learning and schooling can be an avenue for discipleship. And so that was definitely my experience in a liberal arts or classical type environment. And so came to Christ in that environment, and I immediately was interested in reading, wanted to pass on the the faith to the next generation, was, was really engaged in discipleship. I was being mentored by a guy at my church. So I decided to go into schooling, and I I started not in classical Christian education, but in what we might call public education or government education. So I went through a program. I usually say I went through Teach for America because it's more popular, but I went through Indianapolis Teaching Fellows, which is about closing the achievement gap between kids in the suburbs and kids in downtown Mm -hmm. areas. 
And so I'll punt it back over to you. How, how did you, after you, Riken told you to walk across the street, you saw the kid narrating Jeremiah. What, what happened after that? Yeah. I, I mean, really after that point, I started a internship where I got practical experience in the classroom and started building a Latin program at that uh, small, growing like classical every, Christian Like school. every other 21-year-old right. in the country. <laughs> what, what, what else, what would, else you would you do? You go start but a Latin start, program. Uh, start learning to teach Latin, learning to uh, work with students, uh, starting to envision the high school years later on, and really digging in, uh, in particular at that school, as I, as I became full-time the next year, to... Um, the writings of Charlotte Mason and other great classical education thinkers, because I was really trying to wrestle with this whole new vision of education. You know, we we go through the public school education, say that we've had, maybe you had a, a, a private school education experience if you're listening, um, but either way, we're kind of born and bred in a whole bunch of assumptions about how school should be done, what it is. And so, Part of it for me was really rethinking a lot of those from the ground up as I had the practical experience and challenges of a small class of students that I'm trying to shepherd, to guide, to help them understand the the books that we're reading, whether it's from the Bible or literature or the history we're going through. And so that was kind of my forging ground over those next few years. So you left after you graduated from college, or you started working there while you were in college? Yeah, the last semester that I was in college, I was working like 10 hours a week or something, uh, just kind of as an assistant, but then teaching some Latin, teaching a logic class to a few different students and um, and beginning to get introduced. But it was really when I kind of dug in the next year that, um, that you know, full-time teacher experiencing everything new as I'm being trained. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, California. And so a very different world from Were the Midwest. Were you a surfer dude? I was not a surfer dude, though I was asked whether or not I did surf almost by everyone when I came out to the Midwest at first. So you had long hair, didn't you? Uh no, that was that was only in high school. I did I did cut my hair back down for coming coming out to the Midwest and being at Wheaton College there. Um but you, let's put it back to you. After you got going with that um, early teaching experiences, you know, you said, you know, that's a probably a very different experience that you had in those different places than I had kind of, again, starting out my teaching career at a classical Christian well, school. Well, and it's funny, just when I hear you talk about Latin, I didn't even, I'd never even heard of Latin. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and you took it for four years in high school. I took Spanish. So I became a Spanish teacher. I had the economics major as well. I was interested in business. I took an entrepreneurship class in high school. And yeah, I was teaching Spanish in public schools. I did middle school for a year and I was coaching and I was really enjoying the kids. I was kind of tying the knot on becoming fluent. I was almost there. And I'd say by the end of my second year teaching, I was fluent. I raised my kids teaching. I speak Spanish to my kids. And so I'm interested in in languages in general. So when I first met you, I was like, this guy speaks Latin. And so I know you know Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, right? That's correct. And yeah. So I did my MDiv and doctorate and I survived Hebrew and Greek, but I would not say I mastered. I'm I'm familiar. But basically what happened to me is I, I made it through five years of teaching and coaching in public schools. And I I, I basically got disenchanted teaching Spanish because teaching 17 year olds how to count to 10 get the colors memorized like azul amarillo rojo buenos dias like that's that's like what 3 year olds say and so to teach it to teenagers it just didn't work i was also coaching baseball we were losing most of the games we were in an urban area that was known for football and our our family was growing but at that time i was doing my mdiv at a theological seminary and I was, while I'm teaching how to say, how are you? I'm also reading Augustine and Pelagius's debate about free will. I'm also learning about Jonathan Edwards' faith around the founding of America and how different he was than Benjamin Franklin. So I'd be reading those things in the morning and then I'm teaching kids quite superficial things. Like I had 140 students and then I'd be coaching baseball after school I was involved in Young Life, a crew high school, and I just wasn't seeing much fruit. 
I, as I look at all the kids I discipled, I only know of a handful that are still walking with the Lord. And so I just started to scratch my head. I'd read John Piper's book, Don't Waste Your Life like every good, young, restless, and reformed (laughs) type guy that came to Christ in the early 2000s. And I thought, man, I want to see fruit at the end of this. What could I do? And so I decided to change schooling models because I wanted to to be more involved in discipling kids, teaching theology, teaching the Bible. And so I went to a generic Christian school. And there, it had the opposite strengths of the public schools— at the public schools, everything was well organized. Everything was standardized. The expectations were really clear because everything was operating at scale. Where we're located in, in Hamilton County, Indiana, there's over 100,000 students. We happen to be in Carmel, Indiana, where there's 16,000 public school students. So you have to be pretty organized to move around 16,000 kids. Most classical Christian schools are smaller than 200 students. But that organization and the high expectations, they were there when I was in public schools, when I switched over to the generic Christian school, it was not classical. In many ways, it was like a public school, but 10 years behind, and it had Bible and chapel. And so there was neat opportunities for the kids because they were it was a bit, little bit larger school. They had a football team. But the, the thing that was hard for me was the expectations were so low. And so there was great opportunities for relationship, for talking about the Bible, for really investing in kids. But for whatever reason in that environment, we didn't push kids to reach their full potential. So I know at the school that we're at, we talk about every kid every day being known, loved, and challenged to reach their full potential in Christ. So I went from Wabash, really high expectations, went into another high expectations environment, but no spiritual expectations. Changed over to Christian education, there was a spiritual substance to a degree, but the expectations were too low. And so when I came into classical Christian education, it was like arriving at the beach on spring break if you're from Indiana. It just felt like, ah, oh, I'm home. So Wabash is an all-male school. Uh, Wabash College is an all-male school. So I sometimes say that classical Christian schools are like Wabash, except there's girls and it's K through 12 and Christ is at the center. And so there's... It feels like home to be in the classical Christian schooling movement because there's both discipleship and scholarship. And so I think that's that's what I've always been looking for is that there's there's a real demand placed on the students as well as a real emphasis on discipleship. So tell us a little bit about how you went from the school in Wheaton. I know you spent some time in Florida and yes. then came back. And then how did you get to the school that you're at now in the Midwest? Yeah, I um, so I had a great experience at the school I was at near Wheaton College, um, learned a lot, uh, began to grow as a leader uh, and not just a teacher. And um, uh, one thing led to another, and the Lord called me and my wife out to Florida to a well-established classical Christian school over are there. A, are you a beach guy? I am. I mean, you are from California. Not exactly right a, ble- beach, a beach guy. Yeah. I, well, I was, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So, Um, If you hop over the mountain range, you can get to Half Moon Bay, which is well known for surfing, but it's always like 50 degrees. And so it's not like, you know, Southern California. So you're not like a cold shower, not a cold showers type guy. Uh, Well, I mean, it can be fun, but you know, it's, uh, it's its own thing. Um, I did have a a great experience in Florida at the school I was at there. It was a, a, like I said, a much more developed classical Christian school. And I learned a lot from the leadership over there um, before returning to um, the school I had been at before to help take up a, a new leadership role. And so um, that was that was really wonderful to really see what it's like for this classical Christian model to um, be at scale, to be growing, to be developing. Um, I think it would be helpful perhaps if we talked through what the benefits are, what are like the practical differences Dave, for our audience of what what really makes it different? You've kind of alluded to the idea of academic rigor and that that classical really is um, different from some traditional education because it goes deep, because yes. it, it, it asks more of a student. Um, but what else? What, what would you add to that? Well, you, you could point to really surface level things like cursive, like uniforms, 
like reading the great books rather than Jurassic Park. I'm not hating on Jurassic Park, but not super substantive content for middle school students. But really the the fact of the matter is, and this is in the book, The Battle for the American Mind, the, the fact of the matter is progressive folks that are child-centered and don't care about God have held the supply lines of education for 100 years. And so really our jobs in any principal or head of school or anyone that's trying to promote classical Christian education has an uphill task because we're giving something to the current generation that we ourselves, for the most part, did not get. The way we think about grades, the way we think about habit formation, the way we think about so many things with the classroom are just different. What we're really trying to do is a recovery movement. So I'll just give one benefit and then maybe throw it over to you and we can go back and forth. Mm -hmm. I would say one benefit for me, and both of our kids are little, but we've been involved in education since we've graduated college. One benefit for me is our schools don't treat kids like bags to be filled or pencils to be sharpened or parts to be assembled. In most public schools, they have bells that go off. And it's in many ways, our schools are modeled after factories in the Industrial Revolution where you cram them full of information, stuff them as much as you can get. Then the bell goes off, you pass them down the assembly line, they leave math, and they go to language arts. And so that model of cram, test, forget is far inferior to the retrieve, recite, recall posture that we have in classical Christian schooling. And so I think in many ways, schools model behaviorism, where you give a stimulus and response. Like if you go watch the dolphin show at the zoo, they do a trick and you throw them a treat. Hey, boys and girls, if you all behave for a week straight, we'll have a pizza party. <laughs> or if you all behave, your, 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 your traffic light clothespin will stay on green. And we really want to not, we want good behavior to be its own reward. We want kids to be motivated intrinsically. And in many ways, grades and little treats when they're little, it's treating them like stimulus response, like they're Pavlov's dogs that they salivate when the bell goes off. And instead, we actually believe like Aristotle said that man has a desire to know. The kids want to learn. And so we use the habits of the heart and we really want to get at the heart of them, but also train them in effective habits. So that's one feature or benefit is we treat them like kids made in the image of God rather than like animals. So that's that's one of the first things that I noticed when I came into classical Christian education. What well, about let, you? Let me piggyback off that because I think that's so critical. I remember my seventh grade year math class, we got gummy worms mm. sparkling with sugar crystals Yummy. at the end of every math period if we did our math problems. Every day. Every day. Wow. Um, and I mean, we could talk about the hopefully health the, implications. The teacher, <laughs> the teacher doesn't run out. That would be really bad for learning. I know she she really had to invest. I don't know if that was paid for by the public school um, or something that she did on her own to make sure that she had what was necessary. But again, we think that that's not the right way to treat kids. We, we have been so influenced by the kind of modern disciplines of psychology and behaviorism and evolutionary theory. And like you said, the factory model mindset in our schooling assumptions. And we just think it has, it has an impact on kids' hearts. And so like you said, curiosity is natural to human beings. Kids love to learn. I think there are some famous people that have said that school schooling beats it out of them. And so at a classical Christian school, we're all about cultivating that natural love of learning, um, not by giving them tricks and treats, but by actually putting a rich feast of things that are true and good and beautiful and worthy and having students enjoy them, enjoy the process of learning. So many of our families at Coram Deo Academy will tell us weeks, months later about how their kids are coming home overflowing with the things they're learning about, that they're excited about. And so we don't deny that education is hard. Kids are going to, you know, hit a wall at different times. But the the fact that we're going to put things that are beautiful in front of kids 
and we trust the the material itself to do its work in their hearts and minds as opposed to just trying to entertain them. We think that kids actually do love to learn. We just have to get the obstacles out of the way. And again, I think that's a huge benefit of education. And and because you do that with kids when they're young in classical Christian education, they grow so much by the time they're in middle school. In high school years, they just have a capacity that you would not expect otherwise. I think we limit children way too often in the modern world. We, we talk down to them. We put silly shows in front of them that don't have rich ideas. And um, that's what we're, we're not about doing, right? We, we think kids have enormous potential. Your, you know, your kids have enormous p- potential. Mine do. Everyone that comes to our school. Um, and so we want to unlock that potential by putting something that's really worthwhile in front of them. One of the main errors, th- there's a lot of caricatures of classical Christian education. One one caricature that I had of all private schools was that they were people that were trying to isolate and withdraw from culture and hide behind a castle wall with a moat. And really one of the things that we're trying to do exactly the opposite. Sometimes uh, people will say they want to send their kids to school to be salt and light. Uh, and I've heard one person say, why would you send your kid to the front lines when he can't even hold up his shield? And really, we, we think of Coram Deo or any classical Christian school more like a greenhouse where we want to prepare the the students and w- with the right atmospheric conditions. And eventually the plant will be repotted beyond the walls of the greenhouse. But we're all about the atmosphere, the discipline, the life, those conditions being right for the purpose of discipleship. And so I think there's this idea that you have to go throw a kid into the world immediately. And instead, I've seen much better fruit. And and the Good Soils Report from Notre Dame confirms the fruit is better for kids who go through a model of education like this. Mr. Barney, you've done a ton of tours over Mm -hmm. the the four years that we've worked together. uh, And then you've been involved in admissions and other classical Christian schools. What do you think are a couple features that parents, if parents ask you, what is classical Christian education? Could you give a a basic definition and then maybe some examples or illustrations that you share during the open house? Yeah, I think um, that classical Christian education uh, has a bigger why. Um, And so when we think about education in the modern world, so often we think of the school and getting kids to college so that they can have a particular job. And it's not that we aren't preparing students for the next stage of education or for what they're going to do vocationally. But when you have that mindset of just the one thing leading to another, it tends to shrink things down. So it's like it gets kids asking questions like, well, when am I going to use this math? But is it really about just something being useful, right? There's so much more than that, right? So we want kids to be formed in who they are. The why is that we want kids we want kids to grow up to be men and women of wisdom and of virtue where their minds are not just packed full of information, but they're wise. They are, they are able to discern not only the difference between right and wrong, but how their world fits together. Um, we need more people who are able to discuss with others and disagree, but be able to do so charitably. We also um, want them so say, to be... Say more about discussion. I know in yeah, upper and I schools, think, they often have a, a, a circle or an oval type table rather than rows of desks. Why is that? Well, it's because we want students to be critical thinkers who can really sift what they're taking in. So, so often in uh, our modern schools, right, the teacher is just going to deliver information from a PowerPoint lecture and maybe they'll make it interesting and use a little video in there and do a little buzzer quiz or something to make sure the kids are learning. Buzzer quiz. I don't know. That's a big thing in education these days. Mm. Um, Kahoot. That's what it's called. But the students aren't digesting the information. They aren't discussing it with one another. And um, obviously this goes all the way back to Socrates. um, But even, you know, in rabbinic traditions and in the, the Bible, like having teaching that occurs through questions is so important um, because we want our students to be uh, 
creative engagers of the ideas that they're sifting, right? The Our educational experience is focused on ideas, not just facts, not just them memorizing something for an AP test and kind of spitting it out. Um, it's also not just about skills, right? We want to develop many skills in them, but there's a way in the modern school where skills are just kind of value neutral. Like we're going to make you a skillful writer, but that doesn't have anything to do with how you, um, what you're thinking about or what you're writing about, right? Like yeah, the what and the how are separated. Yeah, they, when which they doesn't really have seem to like a big deal if you separate. Well, the content and the skill they're different. What's it matter if if we separated? This is C.S. Lewis's. He calls people who are educated that way. He calls them trousered apes. Yeah. We we've gone through this with teachers, and we both talked about this in different spheres, but. How does it abolish man to separate content from method? Why is that a big deal? Well, I think part of it is that, again, different type of content matters in different ways. So like I said with my Jeremiah example, if we're reading the Bible, that has a type of meaning that's very different from reading an informational text about emperor penguins that's going to be penguins. on your I was hoping, SAT question. I was hoping you were going to bring <laughs> up the texture of the skin of the emperor penguins and how long they can stand outside before they need to huddle together. Yeah, and so so much of modern education trying to be value neutral. And not um, offend anybody for just goes, Yeah, reasons. yeah, it just locates education around things like emperor penguins which again, I, I, I'm sure I love emperor penguins. I love seeing them at the zoo. I'm not trying to, you know, um, well, they don't have emperor fry penguins. the emperor They're penguins. Smaller. I mean, they, they like the cold, so sure. we shouldn't, you know, uh, heat things up too much here as we talk about them. But the mm. point of the matter- Is that a dad joke? <laughs> that was some sort of dad joke. The, the point of the matter is that it's very different if you talk about Aristotle's virtue theory than emperor penguins. And you have students write an essay about one or the other. That's going to have an impact on them. And you can you can focus so much on the skill and the form that you miss the beating heart of education. We're human beings. We actually want to know why we exist and how we should live. And those things matter in education. They matter to high school right. students. And if you just train them in skills for a job instead of having them go through a journey of discovery that's leading them to wisdom and virtue, completely different experience for the students. This is a huge deal to me because I think this is what I was trained on, that it's all about the how, the what doesn't matter. And I'm fully bought in. And it took me five years to be disillusioned as a teacher. And that was my main job. So this is why I think this model of education has gone on for so long and been so popular because parents don't stop and think. So let me illustrate why you can't separate content from skill and why things like social studies rather than history should be an issue to us. The if you if you wanted to I played football in high school and so I remember our coach taught us how to bench press. Do you know what that is? Mm -hmm. I, I did some bench pressing yeah. in high school. How too. much can you bench now? Like 400, 500? Uh probably 650. Okay. No, I'm I, just I, kidding. Look, where, where did you get you, this from? You look like Why you are could you bench asking six, me how much I could bench? Well, I've always wanted to for the to faithful ask learning. You. It never podcast. It never came up, but bench press, you can learn how to do the form with just the bar and it weighs 45 pounds. But if you can't build real strength if you don't put weight on the bar. And, and I think skill is the form and content is the weight. Reading about emperor penguins and Jurassic Park is so much easier than reading about Aristotle, reading anything from like reading Charles Darwin, reading Karl Marx, reading Friedrich Nietzsche. That's There's so much more substance in what we used to give kids. The standards, did you ever see that eighth grade test from like a hundred years ago and comparing mm -hmm. it to one today. I mean, what an eighth grader can do now compared to back then is so different. And I think it's because of this divorcing the what from the how. We do not put enough weight on the bar when we teach kids to write, when we teach to kids to do a number of things. I want you to talk about narration, Jason. You've written a couple books on this. You've written on Charlotte Mason. My background, my expertise, if I have one, is more thinking about the school organizationally. So my work is called Growing a Classical School. You've written a classical guide to narration. What is narration? Why is it important? And how does it transform the next generation? 
Yeah, narration is really important to me, and it's partly because of how I found classical Christian education. So you might remember from my story earlier, um, my first real experience with classical mm-hmm. education was getting in that room and seeing a student narrate from the book of Jeremiah. So narration is a simple teaching tool whereby a student is called on to tell back in detail some content, some rich content that they've just been exposed to. And what this requires a student to do is actually a type of long form processing out loud of what they've just learned. And um, it's amazing. We actually know from a lot of modern learning science that it's this sort of retrieval practice that actually seals something in your memory. So, it's like um, tying a knot. It's like tying a knot, you know, on a string of cranberries, uh, to use an example from Make It Stick, which is a, a great modern book on some great learning science. But um, the idea of narration is it's hard. It's also really fun for kids, right? Kids naturally want to tell you a story. They want to tell you all about what happened um, with, uh, you know, the dog out on the street and whatever it might be, right? Like kids love telling stories. So what narration does is it harnesses this natural human ability to to tell stories and to retell things um, because that actually works to help the mind remember something fully. And the thing that happened in our modern kind of factory age is that we started just asking isolated for isolated bits of information rather than the whole thing. Um, because if you have a big class packed with 30 to 40 students, you don't have time to call on every student over the course of a morning or day to tell back from something that you've read, right? You, you've got to make sure you get all the grades in. Um, But what's actually best for our minds and best for our hearts, really, is to get actively engaged in our learning through retelling the things that we just learned. It's kind of like the saying that you, you don't know that you've really learned something until you can teach someone else, right? And that's what narration does. It gets kids teaching one another what they've learned. And, you know, you can try this as an adult uh, today, right? If you, you know, read, which you should, you know, you're kind of, you know, have your book by your bedstand and pull that open and just read a couple pages and then close your book and even silently in your mind, try and make yourself tell back what you just read. And you'll find, wow, that's hard. My mind is like being put to work right now. It's like you said with the the bench press uh, metaphor. Um, The thing is that we we actually don't need all sorts of like uh, electronics and gimmicks and technology to make ourselves think. We just have to do some very basic but also profound things in the classroom or to ourselves to make us really get our minds working. And um, I've seen that have a huge impact on kids over the years. I've had parents come in um, just raving about how their their kid can listen now. They're attentive. They love learning. They're excited. And so narration is something that I think is also, it just represents a lot of what classical Christian education yeah, is about. Totally. We're going to sit with text that, um, that are important, that really matter, and um, and that have rich ideas in them. And we're going to help students learn how to attend, right? Kids that come out of a classical Christian education know how to focus. They know how to learn because they've sat at a table and uh, and read something challenging and really thought about it and discussed it with their fellow students. And that's, that's honestly what what we need for all sorts of professions and for stay-at-home moms in our world today, right? We need to train this ability of the mind. Well, and on the Faithful Learning Podcast, especially in this first episode, we're just trying to set people up with what is classical Christian education? What's our backgrounds? Why does it matter? How does it look in practice? So I think you explained that really well, Jason, that narration or just retrieval practice, rather than just taking a quiz we want to get people in the habit of really drawing out the whole story. I know you and I have been working together. Uh, we know of one situation where a student was struggling and the the dad 
uh, he interacted with you and was trying to figure out what to do with his son because they were recommending that the kid take medicine and, and do all these different things. And I remember you telling me that you recommended give the kid some time and let him be in an environment where he has to attend. He has mm-hmm. to give the teacher his eyes and he has to narrate what he heard. And I know we both know that student. We've seen a tremendous difference in that child. We could share all sorts of stories like that where the modern method would have given them medicine, it would have pulled them out of class to remove them from challenging things. But narration really has a big impact on students. I want to transition us to a different question that I've, I've gotten, a lot, gotten a lot by people who aren't involved. Is classical Christian education for everybody? Is, is this is this just some elitist thing? Is this uh, classical education and its history? There are versions like Charlotte Mason where she's trying to increase mm-hmm. accessibility to, to everybody she can. And I know we very much have been inspired by her. I've been inspired by a man named Mortimer Adler. Mm-hmm. His book, How to Read a Book, <laughs> is one of the first things that got me interested in a different approach to learning. And so he says the best education is the best education for all. I know I like to say that classical Christian education is, in fact, for everybody, as long as the parents are willing to submit their their student, their child, to the process. If they're willing to go through the grammar stage where they're doing a lot of memorization if they're willing to go through the logic stage where they're really learning formal and informal logic and the logical fallacies like the bandwagon fallacy, Mm -hmm. argument to med populum, and then the rhetoric stage, which is high school, where everything comes to to bloom and flourish and the kids are really applying what they've learned in the previous stages. So as long as the parents are willing to let their kids struggle through, rather than being the helicopter parent, that's, that's hovering too much or the snowplow parent that removes all obstacles. We're kind of stoic. We like the, the obstacle is the way mm-hmm. type mindset. Yep. But if the parents are really willing to let their kids struggle through that, I think classical Christian education is in fact for everybody. What are your thoughts on that challenging question? Yeah, no, I think it's a, an important question. I think that, um, that it's important that you phrase classical Christian education as opposed to a specific uh, model of it, right? So there are, you know, classical Christian homeschool co-ops and there are classical Christian schools like the one that we work at. And um, each of those things has its own context and is developing in its own way. And so one of the things that I would say is that classical Christian education is for everyone, um, you know, but there are situations where a, a student might need to go at a different pace than a particular place. Um, and so I think we we want to we want to be clear here that, like you said, the best education is the best for everyone. And uh, Charlotte Mason talked about a liberal education for all. She actually had a whole movement of what we would have called public schools in a mining village and kind of the. Um, you know, lower class area in Britain in the late 1800s, early 1900s that started using these methods and doing narration and reading these classic literature books when their parents are barely literate. And it absolutely opened the door for all of these kids who otherwise would not have had that sort of inspiring education. So I would say that in the vast majority of cases too, Even if there is some challenge and struggle in the transfer into a classical Christian school, I've seen student after student come away from that and um, be be like a new kid. And so I think that if you're a parent and you're kind of worried about that question or you're hearing uh, this sort of uh, academic rigor idea or mindset about classical Christian education, you just think, there's no way my kid can cut it. I just say, maybe you need to change your expectations, right? Um, too often we put kids in a box and we think that they can't change and develop in ways that they really can. We just gotta set set that set. Uh, we just gotta stick with it uh, and keep moving with them. And again, classical education is about putting rich material in front of them, and so. It's more of a, a way of life and a mindset. 
and a set of practices um, than anything else. So I think that's part of my solution to that. I, I think a lot of people we've talked with in the movement would say that classical education has a low floor. Oh, I was going to say that. But a high ceiling. There well, you go. took two of the things that I was going to say okay, that's when, you, when you were initially, you know, handing off the question to me. So classical education has a low floor, but meets, a high ceiling. Meets, what's we're gonna, low floor? Low floor means, you know, even if you're sitting in that text and you're reading comprehension, you know, in that class and, and you're tackling Jeremiah and you're reading comprehension right now is not that great. And you can only tell back a few things. You're still going to get a lot out of it. The, the, the point is, is that when we don't obsess over perfect standardization mm. and grades, we actually invite kids to the table. We'll mm. see over a period of uh, days and weeks and months them growing in ways that you wouldn't think if you just kind of put them at their supposed level. The point is the the quality of the material. It kind of draws a student in um, when you expose them to things that are above their supposed like developmental readiness. Um, you see kids doing things that are amazing if you look back uh, six months, a year, three years later and you stick with something like that. So that's what I think that low floor means is that, you know, anyone can come to the table. Um, you might not understand everything, and we're okay with that. Are you okay with that? Well, this is, you know, if if a kid, if someone's listening to this and they have an eighth grader or a ninth grader, is it too late for them to transfer in? No, like you can come to the buffet. You might, it might be picked over a little bit in parts, mm -hmm. but it's like the the call of Christ in some ways. Like, well, I've been the the vineyard and the workers. Like, yeah, the grace is the same. The truth, the goodness, and beauty is the same. And that we're swinging wide open the doors in this movement. Come one, come all to to feast on true, good, beautiful ideas. Not just at church, not just with your parents, but at school for sixteen thousand hours. Yeah, for K through twelve, high ceilings. Tell us more about that. Yeah, the high ceiling comes from the fact that um, the the material we're putting in front of students is so deep and it is so broad that um, students who really excel, um, well, they're going to be able to go all sorts of places with it. It's not going to be like a worksheet they're filling out and bored, right? If, if a student goes to a classical Christian school and says they're bored, something's wrong, not with the school, but with the student <laughs> in terms of how they're interacting with things. Because if you're putting rich classic texts and literature that have stood the history, test of time, that have stood the test of time, they're going to be around. These great thinkers have thought about that idea for centuries and centuries since, and so you can you can believe me that your student could keep thinking about it, yeah, and could attach new ideas and make connections with other things they've read, and write longer, fuller. Uh, essays about it. And so I think that's part of the high ceiling is that at whatever grade level we're talking about. Well, um, and our, our society's gonna... becoming increasingly sophisticated, oriented towards technology. We recently had a family interview and the it's so funny. He's a software developer, the dad, and he wants this a classical Christian education for his kids. And he works with artificial intelligence. And I'm thinking this very tech-oriented family doesn't have screens in their home, hardly at all. And they want a tech light environment for their, their kids' school. And most classical Christian schools, it is very tech light. We have a different mindset. We're not like Amish. We're not just assuming that anything new is bad. What's, what is the mindset with technology in classical Christian education? I know you get asked that a lot. I do often. And actually, most of the time I'm being asked it by parents who want to make sure that there isn't an iPad being put in front of their kids when they're young because they've seen how that addiction plays in and that it's not necessary for a lot of the early development for kids. It's funny, like you said, we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of tech company executives making sure their kids are not in a tech rich environment because they know they've put all the money into designing these things to 
grab attention, but it, but we also know that it it overloads the brain. It doesn't allow there to be enough kind of resources to to store something into long term memory. Uh, a great resource for this that I would point you to is Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows: What the Internet Is Doing to Our Brains. I think it's a great helpful book that draws from a lot of uh, research about that. Um, so a lot of parents already see and are already like grappling with the challenges of too much tech of the wrong type for their kids who are young. That's why we're going to, we're going to do phonograms. We're going to do cursive. We're going to use, you know, paper books well, and you, help them read, really get that. Have you read Amusing Ourselves to Death? I have I not knew. read that yet. Well, but, it's, mm-hmm. on the cover, it's got a guy and his head is a TV. And one of the things that he shows is that what the, the main difference between education and entertainment is in education, there's always prerequisites. But like in almost all scenarios, there might be a few exceptions, like with Star Wars or Lord of the Rings. If you're watching the movie, like it helps to have watched the others, mm-hmm, right? Right. But in almost all cases, you can just go to the movies. You don't have to do anything in preparation. But that's not how school is. Schooling's hard. We shouldn't apologize for that compromise. Like it is what it is. Edu- education is from educare in Latin. It's to draw forth. And so we're, we're putting things in front of them, but they have to reach out. And we got to provide an environment where we challenge them, we support them. And so amusing ourselves to death is a really interesting book. I have one more question. You and I have both read a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins. And if you're watching, we have this hedgehog here. He talks about the hedgehog concept. And he talks about how great companies that stand the test of time have a hedgehog concept. And the, he, he contrasts the fox and the hedgehog. The fox is always trying many different things. But the hedgehog knows how to do one thing. He knows how to huddle up so that no one can tackle him. No one can take him out. He has a defense mechanism and that's it. Whereas the fox is crafty. He's scheming. He's clever. He's trying lots of different things. So it seems like classical Christian education is trying to do one thing well. It has a hedgehog concept, whereas I'd say government schools are more innovative. They're always trying new things. I know public schools are doing way different things than now than when I graduated high school. I recently Mm -hmm. returned to my alma mater, Wabash College, the liberal arts school, and it was exactly the same. I was meeting with the president, asking him, about how he talks about the liberal arts. Wabash is not a Christian school, but has chosen to take the the narrow way, the, the path less traveled. It seems that they've found their hedgehog concept, which is in-person, relational education that's face-to-face. They don't do all line. They don't have a ton of electives. It's a generalist liberal arts type education. If you had to say what the hedgehog concept of classical Christian schools is, is it narration? Is it critical thinking? How would you describe our hedgehog concept in the movement? Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's hard because education is multifaceted and we do want our kids to grow in a lot of ways. But I do think that perhaps the best summary is to teach children to learn for themselves. Uh, so Dorothy mm. Sayers um, gave an address at Oxford in the 1940s. Um, and that's her her talk the lost tools of learning has had a huge impact on the classical Christian school movement. And the way that she concludes it is in essence to say, hey, modern teachers are working very hard. They're they're trying to do their best, um, but we're teaching kids subjects, not how to think. And any education that fails to do this one thing is an education in vain. Ultimately, classical Christian education is about training students how to think, Mm -hmm. giving them the tools of learning so that they can then learn for a lifetime. We want lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. We want to give them intellectual armor. And in many schools, in many situations, as our culture changes, we send kids out unarmed in an age where armor was never more necessary. We have talked about what, why, how of classical Christian education a little bit. You got to hear our stories in this first episode of Faithful Learning. In the next episode, we're going to talk about what makes it uniquely, distinctly Christian in classical Christian education. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you.